<laughs> we are low on Oz property investors. We bring the big names. We have a re- re- really big name this week, Jane. How you going? Big fun. Great. <laughs> yeah. Joe Joe is born ready, apparently. And that's probably got an I'm obsession. Born yeah. Born ready How for you this going, one. Joe? Okay, you, have you got your lumberjack? Where, where's your lumberjack shirt, mate? I'm in a cabin in the woods by the looks of things out, out here. It's sun shining. Um, I'm currently in the UK. So, um, Financial Freedom, I, um, Financial freedom Week. I'm in the, I'm in the back house. <laughs> I'm in the attic. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, no, I do, I, I do, we do have to finish this up. Bang on at 9 p.m. Uh, I know we like to extend it out, but I, um, I do have to, we do have to, I do have to jet. Um, but I'm excited for tonight because tonight is the wonderful Jane Slack Smith. We had you on what, maybe a year ago? Was it? Was year it and a half, Joe. Year and a half. What? It was February so 2022. Funny. Yeah, you guys wow. reached out to me and I said to Scotty, Who are these guys? You know, they've got 500 people in this group and they're like, Can you come on my thing? And I was like, Yeah. And, and I said, what, Who are they? And he said, They're really good lads and the heart's in the right place. I went, Oh, that's good enough for me. And so, yeah, we had chat, right? And now, congratulations yeah. to you guys. You've built such a great community a really kudos thank thanks you. very much thank you well it's it's amazing people like you that keep coming on to the show and bringing the value and that's why people show up it's not it's not mine and jeff's pretty faces um it is the guests that bring the bring the goods and it's just us trying to unpack the the lessons learned um but uh i'm excited for this one and what about you jeff i haven't even asked how are you no, I'm going really well. Had a had a had a bit of a snip, but well, not snip. Had a haircut. That's a different kind of thing. Um, but I had had a haircut, so I I don't, didn't just yeah, it was good. And I haven't haven't started because I I don't know gel late at night. But no, excited for this session. I'm who who doesn't love uh, financial freedom and unpacking the sort of considerations when selling a property because I think it's a bit of a taboo thing that people don't talk about. So we love to go where no property investment kind of things talk about and don't don't necessarily go. So. It's going to be a, a huge session, lots of frameworks, lots of fun sort of financial freedom stuff as well. So I, I think have, have I promised, have I pumped it up enough, up enough, Joe? Oh, yeah, I think you've done all right. I think you've done all right. But I think, I think one of the biggest considerations is like to maybe plan in to sell um, for some people, depending on what their portfolio and structure looks like and how they're actually going to achieve their goals. Um, you got the disclaimer, Joe? Uh, we do, we do. The cop Always. disclaimer. Yeah, and none of this is financial bit. advice. I hope this button works. Oh, it does. Look at yeah, that. Yeah, there you Perfect. go. Um, so we have. Uh, yes, this is none of this is financial advice. We are we are um, just a couple of mates having a conversation about property. So, yeah, please don't please don't sue it. Please. Yeah. No. So great. Um, so on that on that note, that's it's it's really interesting because you, you've got a you've got a really sort of. A lot of people do will do it randomly, and and I think it was topical given the interest rates have risen so quickly, and mm. and and quite high. So it's sort of, I mean, relatively sort of high for some people. Some people maybe not 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 so high. That, that's a question for you, Jane. What, what were interest rates when you bought your first property? Were they sort of were they high? Jeez, oh, seven or eight percent <laughs> roughly. I have no idea. Two thousand and one. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, it's funny, it's, it goes almost to the question of, you know, when should you buy? When's the right time to buy? And for me, it was always when I had the money and I, um, I didn't, didn't look at what was happening in the market, didn't listen to the trends. It was like when I had the, prop, I had the money, I'd buy the best possible property I could buy with the Trident strategy in the best possible location that fit my long-term goals. So interest rates, you know, yes, they you know, 4%, right, in the last year. It's just like horrible. But the reality of that is is that, you know, we're, we're looking at the fact that if you are actually, you know, looking at having a buffer and you have a plan of what you want to buy and what the long-term you know, goal of that property is, the interest rates, if you can afford it, yeah, it was it was immaterial. Don't know if people just saw that, but I just wanted to highlight that back in two thousand and one, the interest rate was was around five was pretty much as it is now, or the cash oh, rate. Yeah. At least. So it was it was it was just above five percent, and then and then towards the end of two thousand and one, it went to about four point four point two. So and we're now at four point one. So 
history doesn't repeat, but it does it does rhyme. I should have made that my quote. Well, it's but interesting because now- I actually um, went after I started the mortgage breaking um, business, I created these little cards that people could have as sliders. They could work out how much their interest rates were. And so I had them between, I think it was 5 and 9%. And which was really great when I started the business around like 2005, but then they went low and I was like, oh, I can't use these for a few years. And then, they, you know, so it was kind of like these cards came out every now and then based on when the interest rates were. It's hilarious. What's old is new again and what's new is old, right? There you go. Yeah. yeah. And you can now, you know, only just start looking at considering bringing them back because we're at what? We're starting to finally get there, oh, but for how long? What are your views actually on on the interest rate? Like, <laughs> where where do you see it going? Um, I mean, you're quite inside the the sphere of interest rates and uh, broking. So, what, what do you kind of? Yeah. Well, it's really interesting, and uh, and I guess you know, I'll probably make a big announcement about my broking too a bit later, which might yeah. uh, you know <laughs> might throw all this out the window. But uh, you know, I, I read the. RBA governor's information, I read experts' information, I look back at what they said last year, they all got it wrong. I'm like, yeah, do we really believe it? You know, some people think we've been in recession since January. Some people think that we're about to go into one. Some think people think that we're going to be in one, in, you know, 50-50 chance in a few months' time. You know, I think what we have learned over the last few years and, you know, me for investing over 20 years is that you know people who make predictions they they kind of hide away when they get them wrong and they come out and say <laughs> look at me will they get the right i think the reality is though that um you know i'm a i've always studied the data and always studied statistics looked at the demographics try to get a real understanding of who my tenants are what's driving the market <clears throat> and you know, just little simple observations, for instance, you know, when I was trying to work out back in, you know, 2020, 2019, 2020, 2021, you know, where the, the market was um, and, you know, where people were buying, you know, it's fine to follow the data. But then anecdotally, two of the employees that I had working for me in Melbourne, their families were coming from Columbia or overseas and going to Adelaide. I was like, well, why is everyone going to Adelaide for and, you know, we know, you know, Peter Kalisis, you know, he, he loves Adelaide. But uh, I was like, Pete, why are they going there? I don't know. And I thought, I've got to get to the bottom of this. So I started ringing um, immigration lawyers. I was like, what is going on? Why are you telling people to go to Adelaide? And they're like, well, it's a capital city, but it's considered regional. So they get more points towards their permanent residency. So become permanent residents sooner. I'm like, there you go. So it was like guys, you know, have a look at Adelaide. Let's, you know, there's going to be immigration going to move there. And then obviously the Adelaide market went up and, you know, it worked. I believe that's still still the case, um, yeah. still the case to get that. Um, and we yeah. have a big influx of immigration coming through, which is going to be pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah. And I think, you know, just looking at what's happening in the future, there is obviously there's a lot of people, a lot of financial difficulty. And, you know, I, I, we spoke to someone last week from Debt Solution, Angel Solutions, and, um, you know, just the, the stories that she has. Sorry? We had her on. Um, Kitty. Yeah, Kitty, 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 Kitty Thomas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, just amazing. And just the stories of the people she's talking to and, and people just not um, uh, putting their head in the sand and going, you know, what? Well, I'll wait till I, I miss a payment and they come knocking. Where you know things could get done sooner, and I, I think there's a lot of people that are affected by a four percent interest rate rise and the predictions that they, they could go up higher. And you know, then on the other hand, we've got the government cutting fuel levies, going, "It's okay, we'll put money back in your pocket." You know, we've got a surplus, and then you've got others going, "Well, you know, two hundred thousand was kind of where we were with immigration. They're predicting four hundred thousand. We had well." up near that in the last 12 months. But there's these secret, um, you know, immigration stats too. It's not the permanent residents or the people who are getting, you know, the, the expert kind of status visas. It's the, the you know, tourists that are back for six months. It's the students that are back. It's the people bringing their family members over. And so we've, all, we've got this huge kind of extra, you know, group of people that we have to house as well. And we go to Maslow's, you know, hierarchy of needs. It's like, Sanctuary and and food are the basic needs. Everyone needs somewhere to live. And so we're not building enough. Property prices, you know, you look at the data out this week, they're already going up. 
they're moving, they're still down from last year in the major capital cities, but they're moving upwards. Rental mm. vacancies indicate that, you know, there's a lot of tightening there still. And then we've got people who want to live here. You know, the safety and sanctuary of Australia, you know, Fortress Australia, we got through COVID and, you know, we're, we're in a surplus. So we're doing okay mm. and I think we're really attractive to overseas countries and people that want to live here. Why not? Greatest country yeah. in the world. It's actually, so I'm in the UK right now and um, I've been here for a day and I've already heard people saying, oh, you Australians, you are taking all our NHS staff, which is the National Health Services staff, right. making all our highly qualified nurses and doctors and importing them over to Australia. I was like, oh, that's very interesting. Like, hey, that's you don't actually... want to live in England, mate. The bee's warm and the weather is rubbish. Of course they'd come yeah. out to Australia. I mean, having nice said that. The, the if, weather, you, if you've taken a child to um, the children's hospital recently, the average eight wait times for 12 hours. Where? Like, we do That's need them. <laughs> quite a long time yeah. for emergency. Yeah, it is. is it? Yeah. Um, so shall we use get quote on to of the, the week? So we, we, have, we, have, to, we have to we have to schedule. I'm going to try and keep us focused. So, Jane, since you're the, you're the guest, you are going to be the mm-hmm. quote of the your first person to go, and I'll go for Joe. Well, this was a quote that my first mentor gave, well, probably my second mentor, gave me back in around 2004 when I was starting the mortgage broking business. And he said, you can count the apples on the tree, but you can't count the seeds in the apple, which essentially said, you know, um, and the way that I took that was, you know, as a mortgage broker, I could see a lot of mortgage brokers going, you know, I've got to do the deal got to write a loan to eat. And often I'd just say, look, I don't think this is in your best interest. And I'd send people away. And then they'd go and tell five people to, you know, come to me because I'd tell the truth. And so, yeah, you can count the apples on the tree, but not the seeds in the apple. Oh, okay. I like that one. I thought it was going to go. I thought it was going to go a different path, and as in, you could kind of you can count the, you can see the the very clearly obvious sort of stuff, but it's the you obviously can't see inside the apple to count how many is there. So it's kind of the stuff underneath the surface. But yeah, there you go. That, that kind of that kind of talks to like long term yeah. value. I see that as the seeds of being the compound interest of what else can get laid out, which is exactly what my quote of the week is. It's maturity is achieved when a person postpones immediate pleasures for long term value. Um, and I see this all the time with property mm-hmm. investing. Like it's not, it's not the people that, that make money in two years, which is what I'm excited about. I, I see it's people that have purchased a property five, seven, ten years ago, and they've now got six properties um, and they're, mm-hmm. they're now well on their way to achieve that. Um, but it's because they, and I'm like, so how did you get here? Well, I slept on the floor. I did this. I did this. Yeah. I bought a renovation. I bought a subdivision. I had to learn about this. I sacrificed. I worked hard. Um, and it, and now it's starting the fruits of that little little tree is starting to give them, give them some goods. It's interesting, um, you know, you say that because a lot of my friends are going overseas having holidays and we were sleeping on the floor because of the fumes of the paint during the renovation, you know, in the kitchen kind of thing. So, you know, they were like, everyone's in somewhere warm and we're freezing to death with no food and a microphone, you know, microwave to make dinner for six months of the year. <laughs> What's your quote, anyway, Jeff? Quote out. <laughs> my, 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 my quote is... If a goal is worth having, it's worth blocking out the time in your day, uh, day day life necessary to achieve it. So I, I think for me, that sort of talks to everybody has the vision board and all this kind of stuff. Well, not everybody, but a lot of people or some people do. And, and they sort of say, okay, great. I've got that vision board, but they don't actually then allocate the time to then. So they set the goal and they don't actually, it just sits in the and gathers cobwebs. And then, mm. and then three years, three years have passed and you still got that goal you were going to achieve three years ago, but you haven't actually taken action to, to go and achieve it. So, so have that goal, great, but, but actually set, set time aside to make sure you're, 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 um, you're mm. achieving it because if you don't, then it'll just keep sitting there and you won't achieve that goal. Mm. Yeah, a goal yeah. is just a dream. If a goal doesn't have a plan, it's just a dream, right? It's just, just you know, manifesting. Yeah, I, I, I um, set are about 10 intentions every single morning before I get out of bed and I change them up probably every six months and the intentions everything around you know what I want to create and my goals but action steps to do them but there's an awareness point right because by setting the goal is one thing and just you know the secret if you think it's going to turn up is not true and you know I was one of in 2020 when we were in lockdown in Melbourne I set a goal of just seeing the extraordinary and the ordinary and taking photos of it and sharing it whilst I was on my like two hour walks were allowed out. 
And so I started sharing some photos. And last year, someone said to me, you know, those photos, I don't post on Facebook. I don't like, I don't whatever, but your photos got me through a really hard time. And three people in a week, like a miner up in Mount Isa and a digital marketing guy I was coaching and, and, uh, and a mortgage client. And I thought, isn't that weird? And I've been throwing some of them on Unsplash and I went and had a look to see, you know, uh, am I achieving my goal? And it said 30,000 people had looked at my photos and I was like, that's extraordinary. And then I realised it was for the last 30 days, it was 1.2 million and now it's almost 2 million. And you're like, you know, you set an intention that you're going to make, you know, help people, but, you know, make something that is a pretty shit situation you know, some, something good. And there you go. Awesome. I love that. Um, okay. Well, I'm excited for this session because mm-hmm. you've got a wealth of property knowledge, not just photography skills. There is a wealth of property knowledge behind you. You've been doing this a long time. And um, I think if anyone's qualified to give us some information about should we be buying, should we be buying, should we be selling, what should we be doing? Um, you're the most qualified for this. So we're just going to jump into our, and if anyone has any questions as well, um, Jane's absolutely amazing. So throw some questions. We want to make this as interactive as possible. And uh, and then we can jump into it and make it happen. And, and Jeff will intro. The amazing thing with commercial property investing is that in most cases, it's cash flow positive from day one, which means that you can drive those profits towards paying down the debt. There are instances with commercial property investing where you can actually have the property pay itself off over 10 years, which is absolutely crazy. With commercial property, you get massive net yield, so you can expect anywhere between 6 to 10%. And as we've seen in the current boom, these properties not only provide large cash flow, they do certainly grow wildly in value too. Now, with big rewards comes some risk, and this is why you should de-risk your investment as much as possible. And the way you do that is with expert due diligence. And this is why we highly recommend people hire professionals to help you along in your investing journey. Steve Polisi of Polisi Property is one such expert. Being a chartered mechanical and structural engineer in a past life, Steve draws on his analytical and mathematical skills to do that expert due diligence for you. With six years experience in the space, Steve has over 1,200 property transactions under his belt. He's the guy you want in your corner, crunching the numbers and finding the best properties in the best locations, along with ensuring that you avoid the mistakes. Steve has actually even written the book on commercial property investing in Australia. And not only is it a bestseller, I believe it to be the most comprehensive in commercial property investing on the market today. He's been generous enough to give us a massive discount for our audience of 50%. So use the code OZPROP, click the link below, get a copy today and start learning and getting on your commercial property investing journey. I think, um, not sure if police has actually changed that back to 50% because he changed it to 100%. He was given away for free. So go and, go and check that out. I will get that link. But Jane, <laughs> the, pers- the person who, who has spent, uh, spent a lot of time, to- oh, spent some time you know, spending some time with us tonight. Who, who is for those who've been living under a rock, and that's uh, very apt because you used to work in mining as an engineer. Um, yeah. So the people don't know you, Jane. Um, so you were one of the first women to. And I, I mentioned this last time, but I think it's it's worth mentioning again. Into the male domain of underground coal mining. So you went on to become an explosive expert. So how how good is that? Um, and and mm-hmm. I think as well, you you started, um, you moved on from that explosive career and, and when it entered an even, even, uh, even more fast paced kind of fast paced finance in 2005 and you won Australian broker of the year twice. It's sort of, I mean, that's according to my information, you could have won it more times now. Um, and, and you've, you've also done over, over five, oh, you updated this. Cause I, yeah, there you go. You did update it. over cause I had it over 200 million in loan writing. So now it's over 500 million. So you've done, You've done three hundred million since since that was on your I think that was on your um, LinkedIn. <laughs> you need to update your LinkedIn there, but um, you, and that so you did you did eighteen years in mining, eighteen years of, as a mortgage broker, and what next? I think there could be something there, um, and and you've you've got your your success club creating a life of abundance. So how good is that? Uh-huh. What, what is there you haven't been doing, Jane? Um, no, I'm pretty much Easy. across everything. <laughs> Having a lot of fun, having a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, you know, wife, mother of a teenage boy who's 
you know, chooses to speak to me every now and then. Or, and, uh, oh. and yeah, having a good time, actually. <laughs> it's going to be a fun time. But, but so we, we love to start this. There's these sort of interviews with usually people's mm. first property investment. But I think we're going to mix it up and I'm going to ask you your favorite property investment, which will dovetail into the selling side of things and, and the questions around that. So yeah. tell us about your favorite property investment. Uh, you know, it's almost like choosing a favorite child and lucky I have an only child. But um, <laughs> so, you know, we had eight investment properties. So we have sold three. And the I think the first one was really very special, you know, because 2001, you know, bought it for $425,000, borrowed, begged, stole, got a credit card, got a $50,000 loan, did a renovation. Six months later, it's worth $700,000. You know, took the equity out and then used the equity to purchase all the other properties. And so whilst I did that one, my husband did the property next door. So, you know, we we created that money out of thin air with the renovation and that was the key and the foundation to everything. And then, you know, but if I think about the favourite, the one that we've just sold, which settles this Friday, um, was the last property we purchased and we, I think it was probably the biggest renovation. 17 years later, it had the renovation still held up and wow. you know, it was where Investors Choice Mortgages was born. It was where my son Max was born. You know, it really was the start of a lot of things. And, you know, the funny thing is, I guess, being an educator in the property space and, and the renovation space and, you know, the finance space for so many years, it's we, had, we bought between 2001 and 2006 and went, well, that was the goal. Like that was the strategy to buy enough properties to have the life that we wanted. So we were out. And, you know, and then, you know, obviously daily, weekly, monthly, I was speaking to hundreds of people about their property investing, et cetera. So I was still in it. But and the active properties that we had, you know, the last one was 2006 and we just sold it. The last, so you, you sold the most recent, the most recent one was the last one that you purchased. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so I guess that's so fairly you aggressive. Of- like that's a fairly aggressive approach, isn't it? Like um, so six properties in, in five Eight years. Properties. Essentially. Sorry, uh, eight Todd came into the relationship with one and we bought seven. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah. wow, that's, yeah, that's great. So weird. seven properties in five years. Oh, I mean, that's, that's not, I mean, some people do like, don't they do 10 properties in 10 minutes, Joe, these days? All right, well, that's true. People do do 10 properties in 10 minutes. If you go to all their Facebook ads and um, I'm sure they do. <laughs> um, but no, I think that, I mean, how did that feel at that point in time? Did you feel like you were going gung ho aggressive or, or was it more of like, hey, this is just what we have to do and we're going to do it as quickly as possible? Or... That's, yeah, that's a good question because it never uh, – because as an engineer, right, I looked at the 16,500 suburbs in Australia and went, well, success leaves clues. How do I work out which, which suburbs to buy in? And so I went and did a regression analysis on the last 20 years of, you know, which, which suburbs went up in value and went, well, what characteristics they have? I want that. So I kind of like had taken de-risks as an explosives engineer. It was all about risk assessment. So I de-risked the the growth. Um, And then I looked at things like, well, if 30% of Australians live in uh, rental properties, then I want to be in a suburb with 30% renters because I want to de-risk the fact that I don't have a tenant. And then I want to know what the typical property is so that the typical person wants it. So if I want to sell uh, quickly or you know I, I can sell it it's not like the best house in the street or the worst and then I then de-risked it even further in going well how do I make money out of thin air so if I can take a $425,000 property with 50 grand in six months to a $700,000 property then I just actually made more than my annual sal- salary and so there wasn't a fear around it because it was just a structured approach. It was like, do this, do that, you know, and that's essentially what the Trident strategy was. Know the market well enough to buy under the market, renovate and understand the pricing disparity in a suburb of what the higher um, renovated properties are and the lower are and the cost and the holding cost to know that I can make a profit and be in the growth, you know, phase. And, you know, I've sold thousands of courses um, on renovating and it's uh, and it's kind of like you know people really want the color schemes and the the blueprints and you know you know, the all the things that we had in the course and so it's a 12 module course 
the last six modules of the renovation. The first six were the things that they didn't really want, but we made them go through it. It's like, what's your goals? You know, understand yeah. the market, understand how to buy, understand the checklist, understand the analysis. And, uh, you know, going back and talking to, you know, this the people who followed the bouncing ball, um, they came back and went, you know, we made so much out of the renovation. We thought we were kings in 10 days. You know, we'd taken a, a property with $17,000 up by 60 grand, but two years later it was worth 300000 more because of where it was positioned. So, you know, I know that um, renovation yeah. and cash flow helps you push up the rent and, you know, the renovation helps your tenants stay there so it's less vacancies and less cleanup and less, you know, renewals. But and it helps you hold the property, but it's the growth that helps you actually retire to the dream life you want. Yeah, and I think that that's. I was actually having a conversation with um, a person, an investor to today, um, and he was like, "I did all the research. I found all the infrastructure. I did all the population, the demographics, the research, the data, the da da da." And uh, he's like, "So then." I bought a townhouse and I was like, oh, wh wh where did you, wh where did you buy this? He's like, oh, you know. No, where, why sticks. did you buy a townhouse? <laughs> why did you buy a townhouse? Some town, well, not all townhouses no. are, you know. I mean, look, if you're buying a townhouse in Mossman on the, <clears throat> maybe, maybe, just maybe. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. And, and houses, right? Did all the research on houses and ended up with the townhouse. And then ends up buying a townhouse. It's like, I can't believe you did all of that energy. And then, you know, he's like, yeah. And then five years later, we sold it for no profit. So it's like, mm. what, what was the point? And it's, it's like what you said there was identify the asset type for that area. Mm. What is the, Absolutely. what is the typical asset that's selling? Because he would have realized that no, it's not, it's you do all of that research and you still didn't get the growth because you bought the wrong property um, at the wrong time. Um, but yeah, definitely. And, and you see that, you know, people do all this research and they spend all this time getting to the right suburbs and you're like, winning, go you like, you know, check, yeah. let me know how you go in six months time. And they come yeah. back and go, yeah, I bought in that suburb. I bought a unit. I'm like, why'd you buy a unit? It's like, well, it took so long and I ran out of, you know, the prices went up. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to buy in the suburb. So I bought a unit there. I'm like, but that wasn't the property you should be buying in that area. You should have started again and go back and actually see where you can afford, buy the best possible property you can afford in the area with the greatest growth. Yeah. 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 So, so that was, so your favorite property was that was the last one you acquired yeah. and, um, and it was your favorite because you, of the memories associated with it or what was the reason? If it, um, was it yeah, I think so. You know, because of the memories associated with it, because, you know, we were, we were moving and we're buying and we're renovating to save money was living in these dumps covered in like, you know, um, well, you know, most of the time I was covered in <laughs> dust and dust and uh, rock dust for the previous 18 years so we didn't expect to wake up and then you know be covered in in plastic <laughs> as well. but you know we we're just living in renos you know pretty much all the time and you know we had this beautiful unit with the view over bondi beach and that was going to be the unit that we kind of retired to right i'm 52 mm -hmm. i was a bit older and 55 and was like you know this yeah you know, when, when it gets good, this is where we're going to sit. This is our view. And so we moved there during the winter when it was hard to rent and we renovated at that time and it was beautiful and we moved out and it was summer and, you know, people moved in. And that was the first one that we sold. And, it, you know, I've always been against units. We had two in the portfolio when we were, you know, screwing up. It was unique, beachfront, beautiful. And, uh, and I recall that um, they were saying, it was, you know, I think there was like eight units in the little block and it was next to the old diggers and they came back and said, look, we're going to have to spend $100,000 per unit to actually do the concrete kind of stabilisation, et cetera. And we had some estimates done and the guy next door said, my dad's a builder and reckons it will be about 250000 each. And so we looked at it and it was like, wow, what's the value that somebody added? We spoke to the real estate agent and they went, nothing, because it's all structural. Mm. And so we turned around and said, well, this is a unit, you know, it's it's going to go up in cost. It's going to take years to do this. Do we really want to be in it? And the decision was no. But we didn't want to sell it to someone who's going to you know, buy their dream home and then go, I have to pay 250000 So we went to the agents and said, like, sell it to a developer, declare everything, make sure everyone knows things because, you know, we, we don't want to do wrong by someone. And so we didn't get, you know, the great price. I mean, still made hundreds of thousands of dollars. But... Um, you know, and then the second property was a unit we sold last year and exactly the same. It was, you know, a renovation had started. We're absentee landlords down in Melbourne, hadn't, you know, hadn't been to body corporate meeting in 10 years. 
And then all of a sudden we get these notes to say there'll be $1.1 million spent on works. I'm like, what? Wow. I'm going to fly out to the next meeting. That? Um, that had 18 units. And so I that flew is. up to it. And the document that this guy produced was like 700 pages. And I can't speak about it because it's in the Supreme Court at the moment. But oh, wow. um, it went it went really bad very quickly. And there was little old ladies in those units who used all of their all of their super um, on the cost. The cost blew out to 1.7 million, then 2.3 million, and now there's an extra million just to make good. So we sold that last year um, and that was like, God, remind me never to buy a unit. And, um, yeah, it was we we chased the market down. It was like, you know, the rate, rates just started going up. We're like, we're out. I don't want to go to Supreme Court. And, you know, the other thing was because I stepped in and said, well, you know, I'll try to help and, and come on the committee, I really got involved in it. And for the year before that, like the year leading up to the sale, I'd wake up every morning so angry at this person and what he had done to the owners. And um, I it got to the point where, and I was doing maybe five to 10 hours a week for a year on the work that was required to help get this court case up and everything. And, and in the end, Todd, my husband just went, I don't know, like what this unit's doing to my wife. You're so angry with this guy. You wake up angry. I'm like, I know I wake up angry. Poppy's poppy's not meant to do that to people. It's supposed to be all like rainbows and and unicorns. Happiness, which leads us to this property. And this property was... um, was you know, it also again, unit or was it like a townhouse or a terrace? No, no. So this is a house and, you know, a beautiful renovation was done. You know, we bought it in uh, 2006 for 620000 and it, it did what it was supposed to do, doubled every 10 years. And, you know, it, uh, so we had that for like, you know, 17 years and it, um it's interesting. About seven years ago, the agent came to us and said the Department of Housing need has run out of housing commission properties, and because and all of our properties were always near a a, um, a hospital and a university because it was like on demand tenants, right? And um, she said the Department of Housing needs this. There's someone you know who close to the hospital. They need a hospital, etc. You know, will you rent it to them? You know, and they pay the rent on time. They pay like months in advance. You know, you put the rent up, they pay the rent and it goes up. So we actually had them as tenants for seven years. And the tenant that was there for the last, you know, three years, things started getting rough, wouldn't let us into the house to fix things. We'd complain and say like the roof's leaking, but then we'd maybe have someone turn up five times, five call out fees and she wouldn't let them in. She had some mental health issues. And then the agents go, we've got to kick her out. And we're like, it's COVID. We can't kick her out in COVID. And so we went to the department and they said, you have to kick her out because we can't kick her out legally. Can you please take her to the tribunal? <laughs> we don't really want to take some of the mental health issues to the tribunal. And so we waited an extra six months and then we waited an extra six months. And finally, they got to the point where she was throwing things at the little old lady across the road. And so we said, you know, we'll get rid of her. And, and so this goes to your question about when to sell, Right. And so we looked at the property. She took the toilet seat. She'd cut down all the mariah in the backyard that shielded the view from the blocks of units, so devalued the property completely, put fake grass in the front of the property so all the grass had died underneath. Like there was a lot of work to get this property back up to make it tenable at the beginning of this year. And... Um, and I just have, you know, obviously have alerts coming through, property alerts every day. And this alert came through this house that was similar to three. And I flicked it to my husband and he's like, what, really? And we'd always said, you know, two million would be very nice, wouldn't it, if, you know, this house gets to that value. And, <laughs> um, yeah, and so we just inquired. And and the agent came in and said, well, you're probably going to have to spend another 30000 to bring it up to speed and obviously stage it and paint it and blah, blah, blah put a toilet seat on it, do a bit of gardening. <laughs> and um, and so we did that. But, I mean, just things like this beautiful, you know, f- Federation house of those beautiful tiled fireplaces and she painted them black matte so we couldn't even recover oh. the original tiles and things. So it was really oh, sad. And, um, it's yeah. It's probably so breaking it, some sort of um, heritage sort of thing, isn't it? Like, I know. I mean, well, it broke my heart, Jeff, broke my heart. It was more okay. important. But anyhow, and so <laughs> it, was, it kind of got to the stage where, you know, and it made me think of this story where this accountant had told me 
that he had been meeting with some clients and um, the husband was saying, you know, how much more can we borrow to, to buy the next property? And he looked at the wife and she looked downtrodden and he said, you know, are you having a problem with this? And she said, well, you know, when we married in, in our 20s, we decided to buy properties to make money so we could have the life we, we want. We're 67 and we still haven't had an overseas holiday because we've been skimping and saving for all these properties. And the accountant's like, you, you guys are good. You're like, you've got 15 properties. Like, it's time to enjoy life. And I think you kind of mm. get to that stage where you're like, wait a second, why did we do this? And was this property purpose? Which kind of brings me back to why do people sell? Like, you know, the, the basics are death, divorce and debt, right? And I also think disinterest. Because I've bought a number of properties where the, you know, you go and you put in an offer. Like I remember when we put in an offer on the unit that we sold last year and we were, you know, we'd been renovating this place in, in um, Bondi, took us six months. We, you know, finished renovation, went, geez, do we have any friends? What do we do on the weekends? And so, you know, we were looking through the paper and, and which is how old I was like back then in, the, you know, got the Millways and the Gregory's kind of, there was no GPS and uh, only rich people had GPS in their cars, not on their phones. And so we were looking through the paper and Todd's like, look at these units. Like they're only like going for four, 400, 420. I'm like, geez, that seems really cheap. So we went and had a look at them just for fun and kicks because it was Saturday and we forgot where our friends lived. And, um, about two weeks later, Todd said, you know that unit that we looked at that was the nicest of the ones that, you know, we looked at? They've got it on for 380 I'm like, what? And so I did a little research on Residex back then and looked at what they bought it for and went, oh, it's an overseas owner and they bought it. The kids have done their four years at uni. Interest rates had just started going up. And I said, I reckon they've got a bit of pressure on them. So I think we offered like 320 and the agent's wow. like, this is horrific. Yeah, this is horrific. You're like the worst people. And I remember I'm on this mine site and I'm trying to put this offer in and, and you know, and the phones, the reception's going in and out. And he's like, what did you say? Like 320. And he's like, that's disgusting, you scumbag investors. And I said, well, put it to him. You have to. And he's come back 10 minutes later and said, okay, got a deal. And so, you know, I got a 95% wow. loan. So it was like a $290,000 loan against the property. And, you know, even though we chased the market down, you know, we sold it for I don't know, eight, 800 or something, which helped pay down the debts, millions of debts. But, you know, back to the question where you said, can I keep talking for a moment? Yeah. Okay. Sure, show, back, Jane. Back to the question where you said, you know, did you ever get scared? I remember one day in my dad, you know, he's a farm labourer, so we didn't own a farm. We worked on the farm from when he was 13 to when he was 70 because he thought he'd die on the farm, but it just got too hard. And... Um, he uh, he said, you better be careful of all this property investing stuff, darling, because one day you'll owe a million bucks. And I'm like, oh, shit, better tell him. <laughs> better not tell him I'm <laughs> well over that. And so anyhow, so that's, you know, I guess that that kind of, um, you know, death. How do you, how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah, how do you think about that? You know, like that that is one of the fears that people have. I don't want, you know, X amount of debt i don't want a million dollars of debt like mm. how do you frame that because it is a hard thing especially there's a lot of culture can, 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 can i actually can i actually ask you joe oh so well go on yeah i was, I was gonna say yeah, why, why why do you think why do you why do you think people are afraid of debt like what is it what, what is the well i think what is the concern like it? religious reasons cultural mm. reasons yeah, yeah. i see a lot of people that that in an industry they've grown up where there's no debt and there's probably people watching this right now that are very scared of debt mm -hmm. um for me I, I haven't really i i don't think about debt in in that way so i don't really know i just see debt as it's i'm here to acquire an asset and i'm i've, I've got a plan of and i need to get these properties and i need to do the do follow the process to be able to get that and a part of that is debt and as long as i can service it then i'm okay it's, so i don't really care how much debt i have it's ones and ones and zeros. That's what I see it as. I mean, it's ones and zeros. I mean, can I can I can I meet the repayment? If I can't, then I probably shouldn't be taking it. If I can, then I'm probably yeah. possibly okay. And what? Yeah. But anyway, how do you and think it's about probably, it? Right? It's putting that buffer, right? And yeah. and it's uh, I love this quote, right? You owe the bank a million, it's your problem. <laughs> owe the bank ten million, it's their problem. But you know, <laughs> I think that the thing also is, is that if you if you back yourself and 
if I go to like I've got a I've got a logical answer and I've got an existential answer. But the logical answer is like if you if you know the numbers and you know I bought a property in Darlington, Newtown, and I was like this this suburb is going off. This is going off four hundred twenty seven thousand dollars. This place is going off. Couldn't afford the renovation when I bought it, um, and did only fix the kitchen like five years after that. So I, I although I bought we bought properties in a short period of time. We renovated a lot afterward as the money came in and we were allowed to, able to. But um, this place, I was like, it has to go up. And it was sitting there. It was like sitting at seven, eight 800,000. I was like, this is, how did I get this so wrong? And then all of a sudden, 1.5, 1.7, 2. And you're like, ah, oh, okay. I was like three or four hour, years out. But the fundamentals were still there and I was around well, backing yourself. And none of my portfolio was ever positively geared I was negatively geared so I was always carrying that debt and so you know although we talk about you know, death divorce debt and disinterest there's also the things that you look at and you go well has the property actually met its goals like did I set a um, mm. a goal for this property this property you know doubles in value every 10 years every seven years whatever the number is and it's going to get me to this point and so we had this kind of conversation we're like well we had this this tenant for seven years it's pain in the ass and we had had the experience previously with the unit that we sold that you know we didn't want to kick the people out they didn't want to leave the market went down so when we said we, we want to sell this now we're out we yeah. could have got 1.1 million when we sold we got eight and that's because the market came down because we let the tenant stay so this tenant's moving out we're like well, do we want to get in another situation where the tenant's still there? We can't kick them out. We can't sell them with it. You know, so, we can. Sorry, I'm going to take a step back there. You just said you said one. You thought you were going to get one point one point one million, and you sold for well, one point eight million. Over one, yeah, and got around eight, wow. I don't know, eight or something. Wow, but so, like so there was a big. So there was a sorry. That was about seven hundred k more, roughly, than what you thought you were going to sell it for. What? Matthew, no, so doing, we thought we were going to get up to just over a million, like between one, 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 but we actually yeah, sold around 80. Oh, sorry. Sorry, yeah. 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 sorry. I thought you said but still, one point eight. We, we bought it for yeah. 320. Yeah. 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 And, and that's the thing, right? Like, that's a Come massive three, amount right? of money. Yeah. That is three massive. Three so the, the, well, the key well, learning from that. Of money between the 320 and the 880. Like, that's a massive amount of money. Oh. Well, so yeah. you, you kind of look at it and you go, yeah, did I lose the money I didn't have or, you know, what? You, you can have that kind of conversation. But I guess where I'm going to is that um, and, and all that money is going into debt. Like we've got a lot of debt. We've got millions of dollars worth of debt. It's not like we're in England heading off to Berlin tonight. But, you know, it's, it's you know, we, we've got, we've always had like the 10 I have millions of dollars of debt. Yeah, you okay. know, it's just like, it's one of those things, but I'm comfortable <laughs> with it. And so this property had done its dash and it was a timing thing in the sense of we've got eight tenants in and then we want to sell what happens. But people could sell because they're portfolio killers. So, you know, I remember doing this webinar once yeah. and there was hundreds of people on this webinar and people, we just I had this simple little calculator, which I've, I've now got a more advanced property portfolio profiler tool to, you know, show people which property to sell because as a mortgage broker, that's the biggest conversation we have at the moment which property to sell. And uh, that little tool, people were in the comments just going, oh, my God, I've got a portfolio killer. How did I not see this? And it's lurking in your portfolio, bringing you down. And because everything seems okay, you don't notice it. And so, you know, you could have... But how do you work a out a, if it's a portfolio killer or, an, or not a portfolio killer? Yeah, well, what, what, what does that look like? So back in my very easy days, it was like, so how long have you owned the property and what's been the growth? Right. So if you've had a property for 10 years uh, in Perth and you've now at a 0.5% growth, you're like, yeah, maybe it's not going so well. Um, so, you know, it takes it's taken 10 years for the Perth property to get back to where they were 10 years ago. So, you know, you're kind of looking at this, um, you know, it, and that was a very simple tool. And the portfolio um, profiling tool I have now looks at three things. It looks at um, things like has it outperformed the major capital that it's in or near uh, as a growth percentage. Uh, are you making more money in the growth than you are in the cash flow in the sense that 
Um, is it? Yep. Is it? Yep. Is, 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 is there a positiveness to it? Is, is there it? A net position? Yeah. Is it? You know, are you actually ahead every every year, or are you going backwards? Because you can hide two hundred. If you're making two hundred bucks a week in rental income on, you know, as a profit, you're going, oh, like, oh, I'm a superstar. I'm an absolute superstar. And you turn around and go, yeah. well, I've spent 10 grand a year. And then yeah. you turn around to people with a, in, um, a growth property and they're like, wow, we did 300000 And you're like, geez, how'd that happen? Yeah. So, so you if, know, your, think- if your rent is negative 10000 but if a $500,000 house is growing at 5% a year, that's twenty five grand. So your net yeah. fifteen grand up. Exactly. So look at that. And then just looking at its position of, um, you know, in relative to the other properties you have, like if you have to make a decision, it's like, well, how do you, how do you actually scale it? Mm. So I just wanted to have a, a simple tool that people could use to do that. What was and, the third um, thing? So it was. Uh, so I've got a cash flow. Actually, I can even, sh- can I share Ooh. it? I yeah, don't know. Yeah, yeah, just hit the, hit the present and, um, and share screen. <laughs> The, okay. the, yeah. It might um, might be an issue. The thing I was going to say about that whole because I was listening to a Chris a, a Chris Gray interview today, and he he, he <laughs> loves his whole oh yeah if I make three hundred k then I can just go to the bank and go and get that cash out or whatever. Yeah. Like, he's sort of, it would he's be nice like, if they give it to you, right? Yeah, well yeah, that's so we that's the kind of that's the thing I'm talking about. That's what I was going to say. Like it's all good and well to have paper wealth, but how do you actually? It's about extracting that. Like that's the kind of exactly paperwork, and that's what you know. To the you know, you lost two hundred thousand dollars because you had to sell it. Well, it was never really you know mine to be honest. But you know, I had made it had done its job and had got to be a painful. So here's all the information you put in, and I've got things. You know, is the annual equity growth in dollars higher than the cash flow annual cost? So you know, I want to make sure that's growing fifty four thousand dollars per year, for instance. You know. It, and, you know, even with the cash flow of, let's say, $4,000 a year, it's okay. Is the capital growth higher than the city? And is the suburb mm-hmm. rental year higher than the city? Because we actually still need to have that cash flow. And so, you know, basically all I did was create it so that it was easy for people to then, you know, do a, an analysis of their portfolio against each other. So, you know, all the information they've got how long you've had it, what's the growth, what's the yield, the repayments, you know, loan to value ratio, equity, et cetera, property type, because obviously if you sell, I did also did kind of like a if I sold, how much money should I be able to make? So if it's your home, obviously it's got, you know, some capital gains tax implication change um, benefits. Just grab the SQM data on vacancies for houses. This is just for houses and I like on that one Oh, that's rental yeah. returns. So, but yeah. uh, this, I, I love how you've been able to do this. Like you've, you've quantified and sort of and looked at it and mm. said, well, here's how I actually make a, a kind of if, if am I am I just attached to that property because I've got emotional memories, but it's actually not one of my top performers based on the, yeah. the numbers. They can hide. They lurk. Property portfolio killers, they lurk and they can they can hide for years. And because Monster you're like, the bed. Oh, I'm making- I'm making, yeah, exactly. I'm making 200 bucks a week. You're like, yeah, I'm a superstar. And, and I so think how do we get, my, so my question that, that I imagine is on a number of people's lips, how do we get access to this spreadsheet, Jane? Oh, look at that. Well, <laughs> You've got to become a member, that? don't you? You can't, not, not a member of prop, but. No, I've got a, um, I've got actually quite some links in, in your sheet of like, you, you were saying okay. what kind of value or how to put st- content. I'm like, stay I'm like, tuned to the end. <laughs> it's like, what do you want? Which, I'm sure I'm sure Jeff and Joe will put them underneath here. Um, but that's, which, which uh, link so, is that one? Because there's, there's about uh, 40. That link is money in your pocket. Okay, so I've got this, like, people are having a tough time. How do I put money back in people's pocket? So I did a deal with um, the Reno Save where I can get people access to the Reno Save card for the for a year so I'm like I'm getting eight percent off at Bunnings and I'm getting seven and a half percent off at Woolies and all of this by just using the Renault Save Ambassador card so I'm just like saving money all the time and then um and then I wanted to be able to you know give people a script that they can ring their mortgage bro that they can ring their bank with so uh, to get their rate down and then I was like well if people want to buy a property how can I help them? So I went over to talk to, you know, Scotty at Hello House and went, dude, you know, your course, what can we do? 
And then um, for people who want to sell their property, it's like, well, how can people evaluate? And I thought, geez, I'm going to have, I'll put it in a chat GPT for, and I went, I'm getting all these people asking about how to sell a property, which makes sense because they've been talking to me for 15, 18 years and they've done what I've told them to do. And they've got these great portfolios. And now they're like, you know, when the, the you know, pinch, um, what can we do to help? I'm like, how, what do I do chat GPT for? And it's like, why don't you come up with a portfolio profile? I was like, ooh, hey, hell. So then I made it a spreadsheet. So because I like spreadsheets, it's my happy place. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, take I'm gonna throw this question out there because we, we were talking about mm -hmm. capital gains and selling, and um, this is this is the thing that um I, I thought about myself with with property price being quite high in Sydney, Melbourne, house price that is. Um, will we ever see this kind of capital gains again? Households are struggling. Both parents are working. Wages are falling in real terms. So what real terms essentially, I mean, you, you guys probably know this, but for people, uh, that's, I suppose, <clears throat> wages increase um, minus inflation or plus in, or other way around. Um, so inflation you sort of starting to come down. Right? Costs, life, life costs more, so you've got less in your pocket. Yeah, exactly. But um, I, I don't know. It's an interesting one, this. Because, what, are, what are your thoughts, Jane? I've got thoughts, but I'll, I'll let you talk yeah, first. I mean, when I started being like the scaredy cat investor I was, like, yeah, let's face it, the Trident strategy is a scaredy cat investment strategy. It's like I need plan A, B and C to make money. And so, you know, my boss used to say to me, can you please um, get a mortgage so I know that you're stuck with me for life? And so I was like, I'm never going to have a mortgage. And then I, you know, went to a Henry K seminar. Unfortunately, he ended up in jail a few years later. But Henry K seminar back in 2000. And he's like, you know, don't buy a property of the person teaching you how to buy a property. Now run to the back of the room and buy a property. I'm like, wait a second. And, you know, but I was going to all these two-hour free seminars. I had like 120 books on property. I'm like, I'm going to learn this. And I'm going to these seminars and people are going, Will there ever be capital gains like there have been in the last 20 years? And, and you know, and we're asking the same questions now. And, you know, I look at, you know, I was born in 1970. The Sydney median house price was $24,000. And if you'd said to people in 1980, the median house price would be $76,000, they would have gone, uh, no. But look what's happened. And I think, you know, the immigration story is going to be the narrative that we need to watch and rates may go up and, and cost of rentals, et cetera. But, you know, I think the government's going to have to pull their head in, the, the different state governments, and actually be kind to landlords because we are providing, you know, that sanctuary and security to people who are coming to Australia and to our, you know, our, our own young'uns who need to be renting. So will there be capital growth in the future? I mean, you know, I think it was Michael Mastusik, I read an article with him yesterday that, propagated out what the monthly growth in Sydney has been, which relates to 24% in the next year growth. So will there be 24%? No. But will there be growth and will there be these other growth cycles? Yes, there will be. And people will continue need to have homes. And as long as they need to have homes, there'll be people to provide them. And which means if we can't keep up with the supply of where people want the homes, then those prices will go up. Yeah, that's, that's the biggest thing. Opinion. Like it, it, it's. I'm very worried. Like as great as it is to be a property investor and get get equity uplift, I'm still a little concerned about where the hell are we going to put all these people? Um, because we're not building houses uh, at half the rate that we were doing previously, yeah. and materials are still expensive. Yeah, build, like, builders are going bust as well, Joe. I mean, this. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and so I mean, like, I'll tell you another happen? thing. We cannot cannot ignore the interest rate rises four percent. So to give you an idea. I had a fixed rate that came off two weeks ago that was 3.3%. Have a guess what it is now. Six and a half percent. Point. Go. 6.7. Higher. 8%. Oh, my Lord. No. Low doc, line of credit. Oh, oh yeah. I needed context. I needed context. Yeah. Go. 9.38%. 9.38. Oh, there you go. So I went up by 6.08%. On a million bucks, so that's an extra sixty grand a year. Hello, you know. So there's always those things that you take into account when you're selling as well. So what's my personal circumstances? Will rates continue to go up? You know. So you have to stack all of these things. There's not a, a, a one answer. You really have to look at it and go. You know, is it the right time to sell? If there's a portfolio killer there, are you going to keep on to a? You know, are you going to let vanity? And pride and ego stop you getting rid of it 
when you could actually use that money in borrowing capacity somewhere else? There's a great question that came in. Um, and I guess this is kind of one of those ones where if you were to start again in, in this day and age, you've done really, really well out of the capital growth um, play, the negative gearings play where you, you, you lose money, but net overall you're making money. Um, and the question is, if Jane built things again today, would you still be negative cash flow girl? Um, which sounds like a superhero, but um... <laughs> yeah, it does. You know, I, I the funny thing is, the cash flow story is a mechanism and a vehicle to hold property. The answer to that is, for me, is is the property going to get me to the goals that I want to achieve? Yeah. And yeah. you know, I know that if you said to me, Jane, you can have a positively geared property in a capital city mm -hmm. going up in value by seven to ten percent a year on average over the next 10 years, I'm not going to say, no, I'm sorry, I want to be a negative girl, you know, and would I start again with a 5% deposit and continue with 5% to deposits? Absolutely, you know, because I, and that, you know, means I have a bigger loan, but, and would I continue to pay interest only as well because I know that within 10 to 20 years I'm going to sell those properties and I want as much cash for me to be able to fund the negative gearing to be in an area that has more capital growth, absolutely. So would I do it right, any differently? You, no. Can we touch on that? That what well, you're talking about interest only? Were you saying you will go? You would go principal and interest over interest. No, only? you would go. You would stay interest yeah, only. Yeah, I think financing interest only. D did it? Okay. Um, can we talk I, to that? Because I, I think that 30, that's, I took a thirty-year interest only line of credit. How, how did you get? How did you get a thirty-year interest back on you? In, back dog. in Rams days, but oh, uh, yes. back in like two thousand and six. But um, is, that, is yeah. that before they got? Is that well, they were bought by Westpac around that time? Were they? Or? Yeah, that was before they like stopped yeah. going to normal brokers as well. But they were, you know, low, the low doc days as well. You know, but they um, and I was sitting there going, yeah, well, if I never plan to sell this property and it's not my forever home. Why would I be paying it off? I'd rather have the funds in my pocket to build up the deposit for the next property or to be able to help me cash flow the negative gearing and hold the properties that I have. And cool. you know, okay. that's, just, super, just, that's, super, that's super interesting though, because I, I kind of like people are like, oh, you know, like property, uh, property, principal and interest is for savings. Like I'm, I'm bad with money. Um, but then they're they're actually, I mean, yes, we're not giving financial tax. We're not whatever giving financial advice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but I suppose if you if you have, I, mean, I imagine you probably would have had an offset. So you'd sort of say, or maybe you didn't, but you'd you'd have that sort of sitting there. So you're still Absolutely. preserving your tax. Well, should be preserving yeah. your tax enough. Really. Absolutely. The way, um, the way I like to the way I like to think about the way I do things, not recommending anyone else do any other any other thing, is I use interest only because it allows me to. Put my capital to my non deduct my non deductible debt, which is my PPOR. So if you mm -hmm. have all these interest only, that's deductible debt. So you want to have more debt in those rather than what I want is more debt in my PPOR, which I cannot use as deductible debt. So yes, you can have that for savings, but let's say you have a, a two thousand dollars, a thousand of it, and these aren't real numbers. A thousand dollars is going to the interest, and a thousand dollars is going to the principal. Um, you then build up a base of two thousand dollars that you know, a thousand dollars each time that is in the loan. But then to get access to that money, as you get your liquidity, you have to sell down. You're sorry. You have to go to the bank and say, Hey, Mr. Bank, can I please have my money out? Mm -hmm. Whereas when you have interest only and an offset account, you mm -hmm. can get the benefits in your PPOR or an investment property. It doesn't matter. It's offsetting that mm -hmm. debt. But then you put a thousand dollars to the interest and then you put a thousand dollars into your own account. And then that's 1000, 2000, that gets up to $50,000. You can just Go into that account and pull that money out and use yeah. that for your next deposit. Exactly. And look, you know, we sacrificed overseas trips, we sacrificed new cars, you know, but we we actually we had a really good life as well, right? But the thing is that it was always a very strategic approach. And I had a friend recently who yeah. sold a property and she's like, Oh my God, I finally get to get rid of this debt. And I'm like, You've got a seven hundred dollar thousand dollar loan on this other property, you're putting seven hundred thousand dollars off the debt. You've now lost access to that cash. Put it in the offset account. You have the cash. You're not paying anything on your your mortgage, but obviously not advice. Yeah. Um, but and also, you know, if your not, situation changes, right? Like exactly. if you if you lose your job, the bank is not going to give you a loan. And if you want access to that fifty thousand yeah. dollars, no, we're not going to let and, you have that money. You, you don't have a that, job. Um, line of credit with 
with uh, that I had, I had $50,000 increments. So I had like eight $50,000 increments that I could actually do debt recycling. So I could take it from, you know, um, mm. make it deductible debt basically mm. by filling up those little the, um, increments. I think the, the only caveat I'll throw out again, if, if you're not that great with money, then then maybe that yes. not, might not be for you. It's a very, like, um, exactly. a very good point. If you are, if you are a dippity doodah and, Grabbing Amazon that money Prime out Day is just come and gone for those people who oh. get get suckered into those kind of easy. Anyway, sales. I feel like we've 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 gone off topic a little bit. We're going to okay. dive no, ahead. No, no, it's through. relevant. It is relevant. Should you sell or should you yeah sell or not? So when, when should, should we, you sell? Yeah, and, I, and we I think, sell? okay. Well, let's. And let's I think dive it is that. important to to understand that there are financial considerations as well. And I do also think that you know. Um, Positive gearing is not necessarily a, a an investment decision. It's a vehicle to allow you to hold the property in the way that you want to hold it, as long as it's the right property that gets you to your goals. And you know, when I when we kind of go back to, you know, you know, people who say I don't want to have debt, and I go to the what I have found. So you know, I've been educating people now for fifteen years on property. Once I Todd and I worked out how to do this, taught our friends and family. They built multi-million dollar property portfolios. Some have had significant health and, and career issues, and those portfolios have saved them. And so, you know, I'm so ever grateful to be able to, for them to be able to have that kind of breathing space. But then um, we've also had this situation where, you know, you've got uh I, I started mentoring property uh, investors around 2019. People kept saying, I want one-on-one, -on -one, you know, mentoring. And so I started mentoring them. And I could start to see that when I, you know, we got from the suburbs down to the five suburbs, down to the streets, down to the typical property, and these alerts are coming up, like, why aren't you buying? And then I could see in their careers, they'll be giving these opportunities. They weren't taking decisions, although in their relationships, I'm like, hmm, what's going on here? And that's really led me to where I am now with your success club is that I was like, there's something else happening. And I, so I kind of doubled down in 2020 going, you know, those people think I have to, I have, to, I can't have debt. So we go back to that conversation is where, where people get really scared about having debt. It's like, well, what's that mean to you? And if you recall a few months ago, I put a comment, uh, asked a question about what were the money stories or did your parents leave by an example in the group and there was like 300 people who commented going no or yes or whatever you know we are um a i would say victim of our genes and our upbringing and we were so impressionable in that young age and when our parents are there going you know it's it's easier to get a rich man through an eye of the needle in, than into heaven or mm. you know rich people are bad and evil and i just know having explored this i've you know there's this beautiful quote by um bishop Desmond Tutu, and he said, you know, I was dragging drowning people out of the river until I realised that if I went upstream I could stop them jumping in, which is kind of where I am now, is that, you know, for so many years people mm -hmm. have seen property as the answer and the saviour and if I just get this I'll be happy and I'll have the financial security. And the reality is, you know, I've, I've taken a step back from the mortgage broking and the property education, all my courses except for this like everything off kind of deal I've got going on, it is that um, because I want to help people with the the bigger conversations, what do they really want to create in their life? And property may be the means or a business may be the means or, you know, but what really is it? And that's what fascinates me and that's where, you know, I've 100% of my focus is today. Mm, okay. Well, we um, let's jump into our sponsor post for today. The final one, you might know this guy, Mr. Scott Agate, your favorite person. Um, and then we can unpack some of the great questions that have come through and get some, I guess, yeah, get some, should we, should we sell? I think we've gone deep into that, but um, yeah, let's dive into the, this one. There's nothing worse than going into a situation unprepared, especially when that situation is purchasing one of the most expensive assets of your life against a trained property expert in the form of a real estate agent. It's a scary thought, but it is a skill that can be taught. Do you want to learn how to become fully prepared when buying a property? So you can get out there, buy your dream home or investment property without the fear of actually messing it up. Scott Agate, the founder and expert property negotiator at Hello House has been helping people buy their properties by stepping in and negotiating with the agents and saving his clients tens of thousands, and in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars. 
Scott has now decided to share all that he's learned over the past 28 years in real estate so you can go out there and do the exact same thing on how to find a property, analyze that property, negotiate on that property and transact on it to get the best results. He's created the Get Buyer Ready course, which is a step-by-step -step guide on how you too can become an expert property negotiator. It's the easy way of how you can avoid all of these agent gains and get the best purchase price on that dream home or your investment property. The course is in short bites for busy people with no fluff at all. Just all the information you need to get buyer ready and secure that next property with confidence at the best price. Scott has been kind enough to give our community a massive discount with the link below. Sign up today before you even think about putting an offer on that next property and it will be one of the best decisions you ever make. Oh boy. How good is Scotty Agate? Hey, I've got to tell you, you did ask me to come up with like the steps of selling a property and oh, yeah. I've, got, I've got a little framework, but Scott fits in as like one of the first steps because when we went to sell these properties, I rang him up and went, okay, you're up, go, go, go get me an agent. And, you know, he went and just did a phenomenal deal and um, yeah, it, it did save a lot of uh, money on the agent selection that he did, but I also introduced him, he works with a lot of my clients and um, he, I introduced him to my best friend and he actually did a negotiation on a property she bought in London, where you are now, Joe, and it saved hundreds of thousands of pounds. Wow. Wow. Yeah, the, the, the system over here is com that. completely different. Um, the way that they run the process for buying and selling property is is so strange and weird. Like my wife's mum is buying a property right now and they don't give the disclosure documents until you've, you know, formally got an offer and going down the conveyancing route. And it's like, but you don't know anything about the property. Well, I'm not going to know unless I put my offer in. So it's such yeah. a waste of time. Yeah. yeah. The chain system is what they, what they call it. Um, one, one of the things, so I guess from a numbers perspective, because a, a lot of what you're talking about was like with the selling side of things. So do you, how else, like just to round out this conversation, like one of the things that I think about for selling is like it's you've got 6% in and then you've got 3% out um, when you sell the property. So that's like a large chunk of, of purchasing costs. Um, I guess, does that come into consideration when you're, when you're selling these and, and thinking about selling them? He's like over to you, Jane. I'm like, no. Nah. Um, look, if I was um if I was trading and I'm doing like flipping every six months, three months, five months, year, and that's a, a lot, but for me to have that cost over 20 years per year, no. Mm. And it's like the capital gains tax, like we're paying hard hundreds of thousands of dollars in capital gains tax, which means we made money. It means you made hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Love it. It's, well, I think people get uh, caught up with the cost and they get paralysis and they stop and like, oh, God, if I if I mm -hmm. sell this property, I'm going to have to pay capital gains tax. I'm like, well, you can keep it. You can mince every night if you want. Or you can sell a property. Yeah, well, it's it's kind of yeah. Like, what, what 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 is what is the initial? It comes back to your your driving sort of purpose for getting involved in property. Like, what's yeah. what what are you if if that's to hold and and use the cash flow, then then maybe selling isn't for somebody. But um, yeah, I think if if it is, and it's a cost of doing business. And you know, I alluded to the the fact before that you know I've been mortgage breaking now for eighteen years, and things are, are changing a little. And um, one of the reasons, there was two, two things that happened last year that just completely gutted me. One was, you know, um, my son's homeroom teacher who was the sports, head of sports, 32-year-old, had a heart attack and died Saturday night in front of his two-year-old and one-year-old. And I was just like, what? But what really killed me was the next, on Monday, the wife had to do a GoFundMe for the funeral costs. And I was just like, oh, geez, yeah, this is bad. And so I was like, I have been remiss. I talk to people about insurance, you know, all my brokers do um, when we start the mortgage conversation, but we really don't follow it up. And my, you know, we offer them insurance, but, you know, it's not like 
a guiding light. I'm like, let's get the right property. I'd rather do the vision call and understand what their vision was and then, you know, the broker um, would be, you know, doing the, the loans assessment and the, you know, impact analysis of what this is to get to that vision. And then about uh, in November, a very close friend of mine, you know, also had a cardiac arrest and, you know, was cycling in a competition to raise money for cure, for cancer, had a cardiac arrest, died. I think it's like 5% of people who have cardiac arrest actually survive outside of hospital and in hospital it's 15%. And so they broke 13 ribs, punctured his lungs, horrific. You know, we're sitting there in the emergency hearing him screaming, hearing the doctor saying this is life and death, it's not going to go ahead. And we're having this conversation and, you know, we've gone through all these things, it's ours and it's horrible and and. She's saying to me, like, geez, how am I going to afford the house mortgage and everything? I'm like, you guys are fine. You've got the investment properties. If something happens, we can get rid of them. You're going to be okay. You can have time to recover. But let's not think like that. You know, intensive care, he survived, everything's fine. And then at the week later, they kick him out. He's like, you're good now, go home. And But he had some insurance that it gave him the time to actually, you know, be okay and, and get back to work. And so I had said, well, that's it. I'm going to go. I'm not going to go back to the hundreds and hundreds of clients I've had. I'm just going to go back to the last years worth of clients that I set a loans for. And I'm just going to say, look, I really think we should have a conversation about insurance. And my aggregator looked over the letter I sent. He said, oh, you can't do that. It's solicitation. I was like, what, what do you mean it's solicitation? It's like, if you go and solicit someone for insurance, it's solicitation. Like, this is illegal. It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. If these people don't have this stuff and they die, I'm going to, like, feel really bad. And, you know, they've got families and kids and debt, so we really have to look after them and say, no, since the Royal Commission, it's now solicitation, you can't help your client. And I'm like, 18 years ago, I gave up a very successful mining engineering career so that I could actually teach what I learnt and the only way I could do it was as a mortgage broker so that other people could have financial freedom and now I can't actually assist people. And so I made that decision to um, pretty much wind up the mortgage broking business. So announcement in the next month is essentially, you know, the, my existing clients are going to be well and truly looked after. And one of the, you know, the things that I had problems with is every time I try to employ a good mortgage broker, great mortgage brokers own their own companies. And so now I can refer to other brokers that I believe are great brokers as well. So I can actually go to my very large database of clients and go, you know, I never told them I was a mortgage broker because we just didn't have the capacity to look after it. So mortgage broking is going to be wrapped up. The property courses yeah, are crazy. coming off the market. And the new courses that I have around money mindset are, uh, you know, pretty much where all my my focus is going to be. Wow. Got a bit of a scoop. That's, that yeah, is, I mean, I'm, is that a scoop? Are we scooping? That's a scoop you scooped. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Jane said there was going to be a bit of bit of news around the broking thing at the start and, and you, you alluded to... Um, Oh yeah, you alluded to the note. So that's that's a that's exciting new. Uh, or I mean, exciting. Oh, sad. I know, right? New direction. Yeah, so it's completely to different. Stop jumping in. Yeah, no, it's no. a great quote to to visualize what you're trying to do here, um, mm. and I think it is it, it it is a lot. Like it's a lot of like you can't just walk into property investment and buy a property and then you're a property investor. Technically, yes, you can, but there is a lot of mental mindset that needs to go in, go in place. There is, there is a lot of like yeah. a lot of background well, I just, stuff. I just that you have created to this um, money mojo. What's your finance formula? What's the personality and how does it affect your, your wealth and your investing and, and your decisions around investing? Because I just, I've saw so many people buy courses, not use them, buy courses, go against it. Yeah. You know, buy courses and go, you know, this is not for me, it's for other people, but if I have a couple of courses and books, you know, then I can pretend that I'm doing okay. And even, you know, I think you've got a framework mm. there, Joe, the investor. I, I, I do. I, I, I was almost going to, I was going to bring it up, but I thought, you know, if I bring it up, because I know Joe has to go in about 10 minutes. Well, bring it up. Okay. Well, I was just going to say, gonna, there's, there's I action. I to do Q&A. I know. Well, there's action, right? And then there's action knowledge. And a lot of people, you know, uh, are in that kind of, action, 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 no knowledge, and they're just gamblers. So they're going to be NRAS and NDIS and Florida and, you know, whatever Florida. else comes up. You know, everyone went to America and bought $20,000 houses. Like, whatever, whatever. Yeah, over 20 years I've seen pretty much everything. 
And then you've got the people who are just beautiful where they do all these courses but they never do anything. They're just like the dreamers. And then you have the successful people where they have this, like they have the knowledge and they have the action and they do something. And, you know, whilst they're doing that, they're the achievers. They're the people that are, are they this, set, you can see this guys yeah. yeah, so yeah, they're setting yeah. the vision right they're setting the vision they're setting what they want to do and you know i i just love doing these vision calls because you kind of go into this dream life and you say to people what is your dream life how much is going to cost like 200 dollars. we go in we experience what you know just as a visualization like you know what what are you doing what's your day like etc come back and cost it out I tell you, eighty percent of them would be between sixty and eighty thousand dollars a year to have their dream life if their home's paid off. And so we, yeah. we're creating these big portfolios where we keep buying, buying, buying. Where in actual fact, you know, people might be good. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing what you can achieve when you when you do the numbers when you when you actually look at what you what you need and what you actually want. Mm -hmm. um, you can achieve what you want in three, four, five properties. Um, you don't necessarily need to go too crazy um, and be buying mental, which I think makes people feel a bit better as well because you don't, there's not as much pressure. There's not as much pressure. Like you did your journey, uh, eight properties over five years, which I think is quite aggressive, cool. but um, it doesn't have to be. You, it can be one property this year and then it can be another property in three years' time and another property in three. And then you just spread. It's really as fast as you go is is really up to you and how comfortable you are. You're, you're in a race against yourself. Well, yeah, you know, I was trying to see if I've got my book here, like two properties, one renovation, a million dollars in the bank. I wrote that 10 years ago and people are still running and going, it worked. I'm like, yes. You know, read, yeah. read the instructions on the back of the packet. Well, let's jump let's, into um, some of these questions. Oh, I, I, I want to throw this is Jenny's question. Ooh. So Jenny, Jenny, absolutely, yeah. I'll try and shorten. This, she this kept it short. Like, I, I'm, yeah, too short. Give it, um, give it yeah. So townhouse can't add value, but great location, set and forget. And, well, and you've got to read it out so people are on the podcast know what you're saying. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll try and shorten. <laughs> I said I'd sell a property once it reached 700000 It cost me $12,000 out of pocket in 2017. Mm -hmm. I... I'll walk away after capital gains tax with around $200,000. Townhouse can't add value, but great location for a set and forget. I want to put money into a less desirable lower outer suburb and land bank and build on it later. I'm maxed out for servicing and can't keep and buy. How do I know if it's the right time to sell? You'll never know. I mean, when you look back in 10 years' time. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, it's really, it is really difficult when you're trading like that. You look at a property and you go, Look, it when it I set myself a goal, it gets to seven hundred, and it's at seven hundred, and you're like, mm, it's done it. And then you look at what you can do if you pull the money out, and you go, well, I can't really do much. Well, if that yeah. if you've made it to seven hundred, it gives me some indication that success leaves clues. It has been some growth, right? So potentially there is more growth on the way. It's costing you money. Can you afford to to pay it? Is it affecting your lifestyle to a point that is undesirable? You know, if you if you're losing sleep at night. It's not worth it. Mm. With two hundred thousand dollars land banking, land banking always concerns me because it usually means that it's in out of area, um, out of like, capital growth areas. I, I, or, I think what, and, what had happened is that this would free up some borrowing capacity. So you'd probably be able to buy. You'd probably be able to buy. I don't know five hundred six. I don't. I don't know the okay. person's. Yeah. So you'd be able to buy something a little, a little bit. Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess it comes for me. Line, it's like, it? because... This is a set and forget property that you can that adds no more value to you, and it's only going to be at a five percent growth rate. So my my answer is just: can what can you do with this capital to make more capital? If it's going to be, if you're going to make more money by selling it, getting the two hundred thousand dollars, putting it into something that else is going to grow, then then there you go. There's the answer. It's just a numbers game. Like I, I get people get too emotional with investing. Mm -hmm. If you've got the time, energy, resources, and skill to go out there and land bank and subdivide and develop and stuff like that, then it's going to make more money than sat there at 5% growth. So for me, it's like, does it, does it make sense? Yeah. But if it doesn't yeah. and you don't have the time, energy, skill, or knowledge to be able to do that and you can't outsource it in an affordable way that makes sense, then, then, then no. And but those the, those no. portfolio killers too, it's not the fact that they, they lurk and do nothing. It's the fact that they screwing up your borrowing capacity that allows you to do yeah. more. That's yep. that's yep. their biggest downfall. That's a mm. fantastic point. Yeah, because if that frees up X amount of dollars of 
capital and borrowing capacity, yeah. um, then you can go, boom, let's get a renovated delight, a uh, ugly duckling, and then renovate it, get the value, boom, you do your million dollars in love. Love you like, too. <laughs> that's, Steve, you. that's Steve Felizzi. Good old Steve. He's, <laughs> easy, I was going to say, when we, when we saw Steve before, I was like, you got good guys sponsoring this place. I had a chat know, we get, Steve we get a lot recently. Of- I know, I'm, I'm going to catch up with him. Baby in- porn that we're seeing all the all, 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 all <laughs> Facebook. Is gorgeous. Um, I, I, this is a question from Brendan Craw- Crawhall. Is that a say? Crawhall? Mm. Crawl? Anyway, um, so so he, he I know Brendan. You, you, oh, you know Brendan. You've had a that caught up one. Uh, I was going to say beers, but you do have beers. Um, so Jane's saying just buy three to four to five good properties and just hold. I mean, I'm saying buy three, four, five good properties and hold. And that's right. Um, Everyone go out, buy three, four or five properties, just hold. That's it. No. Um, Brendan, what I'm saying is what's right for you? What is the goal? Like if you if you kind of look at what you need in life and you're like, you know, uh, I probably need seventy, eighty thousand dollars. That you know is what my lifestyle is going to cost me and allow me to have what I want to do. Then maybe it's three properties in Lithgow, maybe it's two properties in Double Bay, maybe it's five properties scattered regionally. Like it's not the number of properties. And you know, as a mortgage broker, when I used to read people's fact find and I'd say, you know, what's your goal? And they go, I want ten properties. I'm like, yeah. 10 properties in Double Bay and 10 properties in Broken Hill are going to give you a whole different, you know, kind of retirement. So it's not the I'm number of properties. It's it's what your goal is and what those properties can do to get you to your goal. And that's what you have to concentrate on. And if you just, I mean, if you close your eyes for a minute, I know we're running it ahead of time, but you close your eyes for a minute and you think if you wake up tomorrow and all the people you love are gone and it's just you oh, and you've geez. got all the food and power, electricity and water that you need to live out your life, what are you going to do? You're going to have the Maserati. You're going to have the Louis Vuitton handbag. Are you going to have the fancy house, all the windows to clean, or you're going to be comfortable with your veggie patch and your dog, and you know, living life to your fullest with a, a great library? That's a, that's a scary thought. I, 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 I don't like that. Idea. Yeah, that's you, a, you couldn't, you couldn't give me a, if somebody a trillion dollars. I would, I would not want that kind of. Well, it's funny. I was listening to this podcast the other day, and this guy's like, "You got." Fifty million dollars spend it in a year, and if you don't, it's earning interest, right? So you're putting all these million dollars back in. How much could you spend in a year? And I know it's big fun, and you go, "Oh yeah, I could, I could spend it," but it's a lot of money to spend, right? Yeah, yeah, big boat done. <laughs> um, so Jane, what's this new venture? How do we learn more? Um, and give us a run through. What? How do we get more Jane in our life? Because I think. <laughs> because I think the way that we you think about future setting and, and actually setting it up is where you should start. Like you shouldn't just say, what's the best property to buy right now? It should be getting your mindset right. Um, um, <laughs> property oh, Bloom good. podcast. There yeah, you know, someone, someone said to me the other day, I've been watching you for 15 years and you never change your tune. <laughs> Like that's I think that's a good thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you do something you you know, and you do it, and you respect people with different opinions. But you know, for me, buying good quality properties in good quality areas that the tenants need to live in and uh, making money instantly out of renovation—that's it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. What's what's Love the it. best what's the best place to check you out? Oh, check out. Okay, your... well, if you're really bad at, at uh, writing down websites, you can go to janeslacksmith.com.au. Um, I have pretty much put all of my webinars up there for free in the Secret Vault. Um, there's a lot of information. At the moment, you know, I'm really concentrating on renovate yourself, renovate your wealth and your way to wealth, which is around those money mindset stories, the old operating system that people are operating. Um, I've got those courses, my $3,000 Ultimate Guide to Renovation and my $1,000 Location Masterclass course and those two $600 courses all for $695. So I've taken 85% off. I'm like, you can have them. Go for it. Sorry. Wait. Before Jesus, that's a big boy, Jeff. Um, So... (laughs) You all, you were selling it for multiple thousands of dollars, and now it's yeah, it's like five and a half. Yeah, I'm just like Ooh. we're out. So <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you can go to yourpropertysuccess.com.au forward slash the hyphen lot, and you can get the lot. My new courses and the old courses um, available. All the information for the old courses, property courses, will be available for the next six months. Um, 
Your Success Club. I really would love to see people in my new Facebook group, Your Success Club Today, where I'm talking about creating a life of abundance, understanding you know what you want to create in life and giving people the tools and resources to empower them to be able to live that life that they want to live. You know, I, I really I'll join spent it. the last 18 years of yeah, service trying mean, to help people. So I love it. I love it. But, yeah, yeah well, so that's what I'm doing. And- and actually, I think it's I think it's surrounding yourself with a group of people that are on the same path and journey. You learn a lot. I mean, this is how Jeff and I met, and look what we've been able to create out of out of these type of conversations. Um, and it was looking at uh, past like performance you, does not reflect future performance. Show just because somebody meets somebody today doesn't mean they're going to create the the next forty k well, group. You know, think about it. When I started, we had to go somewhere to meet people with property, yeah. and you were hide, we were hiding our property investing from people because you know they'll judge you and you know did you think you're too good i'm like no i'm a farmer's daughter from dubbo you know like you know so there's all this judgment and perception and i can see now these beliefs that people have and how they limit themselves or how they try to bring down others and the tall poppies and you know when i look at what property has given myself my friends my family my clients my customers you know people who've gone through these extraordinary challenges and having that financial security has given them a breath of fresh air to get through you know i know that you know, being wealthy is a nice goal, but, you know, being able to know that you can look after your family at the end of the day and you can be empower yourself to actually go and create the things that you want to do, that's what I love, the empowerment part. And property has served me so well in the last 18 years and, I, I you know, I've been a servant and, and in service to people and trying to teach them about it. But, you know, you guys got a, an amazing community. It was really hard starting. We, we had to do it alone, you know, and keep it as a bit of a quiet thing on the side. And I just, you know, I really applaud what you've created in, in the community and the value that you bring. People. People don't like it when I when I um, when I call out that they mention their professions in a comment, and um, I'm okay with that. I'm I'm perfectly okay that the people now somebody said, oh, all you do on every every post is oh, you see. yeah. But anyway, that's okay. Somebody said that yes in a in a comment yesterday, Joe. But no, no. Oh, I'm consistent. I have a consistent message. So yeah. Anyway, Joe, you got a fight to catch. So shall we? Let's round it up. So thank yeah. you, Jane. Thank you. Jane, unreal episode. I think this is yep. this is one 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 for the books. Um, uh, jump to on the those links. Straight to the pool house. Yeah. Straight to the pool house. No, <laughs> well, is there anything that Isn't anything the else? <laughs> yes, yeah, the pool room, room, not pool house. Yeah. <laughs> um, so anything else you wanted to kind of cover off or, or dive deep into, dive shallow into? <laughs> Look, I, I I just to say you know a, a bit of a thank you. Um, I know it's really difficult when you're starting off as an investor and, and you hear these stories and you think it, it's, you know, lucky them they made a couple hundred thousand they're throwing these numbers out like they're nothing. Like I've slept on floors, you know, I've done hours of painting and, you know, slept it basically to do make some sacrifices. But, you know, you really um, can commit to the vision that you're trying to create vehicle and business and investment and all these things are ways for you to create the life that you want so you know maybe it comes to a point in your life where you do sell or you do close down a business or you do say goodbye to a relationship or whatever it it is your you know your individual circumstances and um you know i hope just sharing this here is being able to to let people know that, you know, you've got permission to actually do it your way and come up with what's comfortable for you rather than having to follow mm. the flock and buy three properties or renovate like Jane or, or do things that other people say. Mm. So, yeah. yeah, I hope it's adds some yeah. value. We'll, um, yeah. we'll, get, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the financial freedom framework. We'll, we'll get it on. We'll, we have to get we'll, you on um, another time. Yeah. have to get you on. I knew we wouldn't have time. One Thank page you. of the five pages of questions, guys. You're so <laughs> Oh, Love it. I, Thank you very much, Jane. Thank you very much, Jeff. Let's go buy a property. Love it how we always wave again. So how good is that?